Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I'm the curator of programming at Planet Word, a museum of words and language in Washington, DC. That's, that's it in my Zoom background if you haven't had a chance to visit yet. Um, if you are already a supporter of Planet Word, a member of Planet Word, thank you for that support. It's really vital to our mission and keeping our admission free and uh, being able to bring you programs like this one. Um, if you're not a member or if you found out about this program, through a channel other than Planet Word, we invite you to join our orbit. That's a planet joke. Um, the easiest way to do that is go to our website, planetwordmuseum.org, um, and sign up for our newsletter. It will let you know about upcoming programs, give you all the information you need about visiting, about membership, um, or you can follow us on social media. That's another place uh, that you can keep an eye on what we're doing. Um, we do have quite a busy fall, more in-person programs than we've ever had before. Uh, so if you are in the Washington area and you'd like to come on down to 13th and K and come to a program in our beautiful Friedman Family Auditorium, we would love to have you. Uh, if you are further afield, of course, we will continue to do virtual programs uh, forever. So uh, we hope you will keep an eye out um, for that programming coming up as well. And that is all the housekeeping I am going to do. I am delighted to introduce our guest, Ganesh Devi. Um, he has been mapping the languages of India um, for decades now, uh, and we are just absolutely delighted to have him join us. Thank you. Welcome to Planet Word. Good morning. So Thank you. let's talk about first, because I know you have a lot of projects and a lot of um, pots on the fire, but let's talk about the People's Linguistic Survey of India. What is the mission there? Well, the mission is to uh, document every living language uh, in India. But I had to call it the People's Linguistic Survey because uh, Indian languages uh, went through a, linguist, a proper linguistic survey almost a hundred years ago. George Abram Grierson, an Irishman in the colonial government carried out that survey. It's known as the Linguistic Survey of India, DLSI. Uh, but that was before India became an independent nation. And uh, with independence, the map of India changed. And since then, uh, there had not been any proper survey of languages. So the government of India decided to carry out a new survey. They called it the new linguistic survey of India. The government officials uh, proposed that they would need a thousand trained persons to work for 10 years at least. But in India, Linguistics is not such a hugely popular discipline. So they could not find a thousand trained linguists. So the new linguistic survey did not take off. And therefore I decided that I would mobilize people from tribal communities, from nomadic communities, from among experts, from among writers, every language lover. And actually the language speaking communities to come together. Uh, I kept working on this for about 20 years to come to, to arrive at a day when I could say to the world, hey, we will now begin a People's Linguistic Survey of India. And uh, I find myself very difficult to believe that that survey was fully completed is now published in 50 volumes, 35,000 pages, printed pages, and covers 780 languages, all of them intact uh, in the books, though some of them died after we completed the survey. Hmm. So when you set out, did you think 780 would be the number? Yes. Really, you thought it would be that many? Uh, when when uh, I set out, I was a confused man because in the 19, India has a, a census every 10 years and it happens in the first year of every decade. So in the 1961 census, the figure of mother tongues uh, was 
1652. In the 1971 census, 10 years later, the government of India had brought down this figure to 109. So here you had 1,652, and in 10 years' time, suddenly more than 1,500 names were wiped out of the okay. census data. Now the 109 names were very intriguing. The first 108 were names of languages, but the 109th read all others. So those two words contained those over 1,500 languages whose names had been wiped out. I, uh, I was a young man at that time, and I started thinking about where those other languages had gone. Of course, the government of India had a good reason to reduce the number of official statistics because the next door Bangladesh had become an independent nation on the question of language. And the government of India felt that if they, uh, uh, if they emphasize the language diversity, that would affect the national unity. So in the name of unity, this diversity was being suppressed. Therefore, when I began my survey, I did not know if I would find 1600 or less. There was no certainty. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, uh, of course, not, the sen not that every name of a mother tongue in the census represents a language. I realized uh, much later that uh, the term was used by the census people merely as a technical term uh, to, uh, to designate claim of any individual. I mean, if an individual says, uh, my mother tongue is planet word, then the census records is a planet word language. And uh, so the linguists then screen that. So out of 1650, when the screening was done uh, in, through scholarly uh, filter, uh, roughly 1150 turn out to be languages in 61. When I completed the survey, I had found 780. I might have missed about 70 to 80 languages. That's That makes it 850, 850, uh, which still means that in those 50 years, 300 languages had died. Mm -hmm. And that's terrible, terrible. It's like looking at, you look back at, uh, I mean, you look back to the past and what you see at the first glance is a symmetry of dead languages. And that's, that's not something uh, which uh, uh, one can enjoy because every language is a unique worldview. When a language goes, an entire world, and I mean, a, an entire planet disappears. Every language creates its own planet. Mm -hmm. So I did not know what to find. Uh, I had vague expectations. And uh, uh, I think uh, what I found was the, just a little bit more than what I'd expected. Mm -hmm. so, so you didn't have a thousand trained linguists. Who, how many people ultimately were doing that research? And, and what, were the, what were they actually collecting when they met someone and did the survey? What data points were they looking for? I brought together 3,000 persons uh, from all parts of the country. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they consisted of all, uh, all uh, social groups, all religions, all gender, all age groups. Uh, there was a, I mean, I, I can cite, there was a cab driver uh, who came forward and said, uh, sir, I mean, this is how we in India people address. <laughs> sir, I uh, uh, it's colonial hangover. Uh, sir, I got uh, uh, I've been rec I got notebooks in which I have been recording words of four languages because when I take people around, I had to wait in my cab in my car, and uh, instead of doing nothing, I just go around and uh, uh, write down the words I hear. He became my linguist. I mean, he became one of those 3,000. Then uh, the, there, were, there were people uh, who were reduced to begging and they were migratory. 
and so I wanted to know if the, that particular migration had affected them linguistically. I collected words from them as well. Uh, some communities which were wrongly, wrongly I say, branded during the colonial times as criminal tribes. They were seen by the society as thieves, as criminals. I collected their languages as well. So uh, I had some of the finest uh, linguists trained at uh, uh, Philadelphia or Oxford or uh, Chicago uh, or Jawaharlal Nehru University, as well as farmers, workers, uh, uh, housewives, and so on. Uh, because for me, a linguist, uh, of course, is somebody who teaches a discipline called linguistics at a university. I understand that. I have myself been a university teacher at one time. Uh, but for me, a linguist is somebody who loves the idea of having to deal with language. And without that passion, without that love, without that involvement, uh, no documentation is possible. Uh, without that, what is documented becomes a, com a completely dead uh, uh, relic of a language which is disappearing. I wanted languages to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, my passion was not for documenting them. My passion was for keeping them alive. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, well, it reminds you why linguists. Yeah, language has made me human. If if I did not have language, the kind of complex language I speak, I would not uh, be a Homo sapiens and belong to society uh, we call the human society. No, it, it reminds you why, at least in an academic context, linguistics is a is a field of anthropology. It is studying humans. It is studying how humans see the world. It is studying how humans interact with other humans. Um, it is one lens into that, but it sounds like what you were conducting, what these 3000 people were conducting was an anthropological survey of India and capturing it in the terms of language. You, uh, at the first level, it was anthropological survey and uh, a lot of anthropological information was brought in, data was brought in. Uh, then uh, we put a scrutiny, uh, sophistication added to that data, giving it a proper structure and making it palatable to professional linguists. Mm -hmm. So it began with anthropology, it ended with linguistics, but it went a little beyond. It helped in revitalizing many languages, which were on the verge of sinking. So uh, that it also had effect on the policy in the country, because after this survey, the government of India quite merrily decided to accept this as the linguistic survey of India. Uh, their work was done. They were very happy uh, because I had not asked even for a single dollar, a single rupee from the government for doing this work. I had done uh, you know, crowdfunding for this work. And, and the 50 volumes of which is an unbelievable accomplishment. Um, what, what can people find there? If you're looking up, say, a, an endangered language that doesn't have a lot of speakers left anymore, what is preserved? Well, this is one. Uh, I think it is uh, the languages of Maharashtra. Uh, this has 64, Maharashtra is one state the west, on the western side, western side of India, uh, the, where Bombay, Bombay is the city in Maharashtra, major city. Uh, this has history of every language. Uh -huh. It has grammatical uh, description of every language. It has linguistic features. Then it has words, uh, wordless words for nature, uh, uh, for instance, in the, uh, in the case of languages, Himalayan, the Himalayan languages, we collected words for uh, snow. No. In uh, Rajasthan, which is desert area, we collected words for sand and desert. In the coastal area, we collected words for waves and so on. So the people's relatedness uh, with nature is captured in that. Uh, and uh, uh, this question of relation is very important when we think of a language. And therefore, we collected words uh, describing various relations. Uh, 
including the family relations or larger uh, larger than family social uh, immediate group relations uh, in addition to that we collected songs and stories because in my opinion no language is a complete language unless one can sing in that language unless it has a song or songs and no language is a language unless it it celebrates the past and a story is always celebration of the past the story is about the past it it brings the past back to you in your present and therefore stories and songs are collected uh, from the people uh, so th these are the things that one finds uh, at, uh, for every language and in every volume uh, there are languages covered for every state there are 30 states in india uh, and uh, so there have been some changes since then uh, some states have been divided and so on, new states created but uh, i conceptualized 30 state volumes each one for each state and i did not want to publish this only in english mm -hmm. because most people in india outside cities would not understand english so we publish all these volumes in hindi as well as in the state language so every state has the volume in english then in hindi and in the state language uh, so uh, that uh, yes and I, I thought of uh, collecting uh, the diasporic languages mm -hmm. because so many indians have gone to other countries i mean you have in the united states uh, many indian languages listed in the 23 official languages in some of the surveys and so on. Uh, indians are there in more than 80 countries so uh, the uh, what happens to their languages when they go out out of uh, their language zone so uh, diasporic languages also ancient languages like sanskrit pali the pali is the language in which gautam buddha spoke the buddha spoke pali and therefore we we have uh, written about those languages as well but i was not happy with all this i wanted to document the sign languages of india i mean when uh, when the children do this and they say they're clapping uh, i wanted to know what signs they use there are seven different sign languages used by people uh, who cannot uh, hear or who have difficulty in speaking and uh, i thought uh, their language should be given the first priority, greatest priority, because they are really thirsty for the word. They are deprived of the word, and therefore their thirst, their craving for word is the greatest. It's like uh, the people who do not get love, they die for love. People who have nothing in their bellies, they die for food. So the signs, the signers are the first claimants of human language in my opinion therefore we collected sign languages and described them through you by using graphics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we created those dictionaries as well using graphics did you find that there were regional differences within india places where language diversity had been preserved or places where um, there had been more of a a written tradition or something that was able to collect a language on a scale different from region by region? Uh, if a language is written and if it is also taught in schools, the difference from one region to another region is relatively less, relatively less. Uh, of course, uh, I can cite an exception uh, when a New Zealander speaks with an Irish person, a language called the English, uh, is there's great difficulty in the two of them understanding mutually. Uh, I know that. But uh, when a language is merely spoken without having a script for the language, there the diversity is greater because nothing is finalized as the standard of the language. And if standard is not decided, then how do you know if 
the English, uh, I mean, I'm giving the example of English because most of the, our audience, uh, I believe understand English uh, uh, a little more than other languages. So uh, somebody speaking English in Liverpool and somebody speaking it in Sydney or in uh, Cape Town or in Bombay, very different because it is written and people also read out from printed literature. Standardization is otherwise language as material. Mm -hmm. a, always in the past, when humans have been speaking for the last 70,000 years, ever since the out of Africa movement started, they have carried language with them. Uh, the, 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 no two persons will speak in the same manner, even in a single family. There will be idiolects. Uh, either their the, the, the tonalities will be different or their sensitivity to language texture will be different. And even if they are not different, which is very, very rare, the ability to use language with a metaphoric strength varies a lot. Uh, for some people, uh, word only means what the surface shows. Mm -hmm. And for others, words mean a lot more than the surface uh, intents. So language difference is the natural material of language. Langu uh, variation, the regional difference, is not an exception, aberration, uh, something to control, regulate. It is the natural behavior of language. And therefore, I, uh, I was extremely relaxed with uh, uh, variations. And we did mention that the variation X uh, uh, prevails in Texas, for example. I mean, I, I'm talking, I should give variation X exists in Kanpur, but variation Y uh, uh, is used in Chennai or Kolkata. Yes. You talked about your goal of not just recording, but preserving languages, especially those um, that were under threat of dying out. Tell me about the Adivasi Academy and your work with indigenous language. Well, I used to, I was a very happy uh, academic. I, uh, I was at Yale University for a while. I was in England, I taught in India. Uh, but one day I said, uh, if languages are dying before my eyes, I must tape out. And so I went to a small village uh, where nobody knew me. I did not know anyone. Uh, very, very far from what, if, if uh, one may say, from civilization. I mean, it was uh, there. Uh, I listened to the people for two years. I did not speak a word. I was only listening to them uh, to understand their minds. And I also stopped reading books. I made myself non-literate, deliberately. I wanted to move out of the lexical personality and to get into the oral personality. My, my consciousness, I wanted to change to a new, uh, a new standard. Uh, then I realized that they, they really attach to the language uh, like nobody's business. And I said, uh, if you sing some songs and if you say, tell me some stories and if I write them down, do you mind? They said, not at all. And so I asked, I did not sit down and write them myself. I asked them to. Uh, sit down and write. They did not have a script. So I, I uh, try to use approximation of a nearest state script, nearest script of script of the nearest language with many variations as necessary. When that was printed, and I took those printed papers to the community, hundreds and thousands came together to see the language in print. Of the, they were ready to shell out hard earned money. I mean, their dresses were always soiled with sweat and their currency notes were crumpled because they were clutching to those notes. They're ready to put that money out to get a simple paper on which their language they, they could not read, but they knew this was sacred. Adivasi Academy was made for such people. Adivasi means indigenous. It was made, made for such people. It was run by those people. It is still being run by those people. And uh, uh, it is their ideas, their desires, 
their perspective of looking at the world that got expressed in adivasi academy uh, so i was not there to teach them something i was not there to study them i was there to listen to them to understand them and to learn from them and what i learned from them is a great learning if you allow me i can state it in half a sentence what i learned from them is the earth does not belong to me i belong to the earth to go from academia to as you say giving up your lexical brain and and listening instead that is a huge profound transition uh yes it was uh, if you like you can call it a spiritual transition my personality change i do not know why it happened to me i cannot describe it in words but uh, if you think of martin luther king or gandhi and ask them why they decided to gandhi was a barrister uh, he was a lawyer trained lawyer uh, in uh, uh, you know the uh, in london law school but he decided to behave like a villager mix with the villagers of india and transformed himself uh, and it was not because of any external pressure or temptation or uh, any any drive or pull from outside uh, it emerged from inside i i was born in a multilingual context i lived in my childhood and i love words and i love words not uh, not in order to use them myself but i love words because every word shows me a whole universe i mean if i start uh, peeling it off unearthing it it takes me back to several eras well, just i mean i use the word indian civilization then it takes me to uh, something like civil in latin and i imagine how would the cities the roman cities be and what would be the loves love affairs and wars there what would be the jealousies and human emotions exchanges what would be the smells and sounds and out of that how new words came uh, i feel fascinated by i i do not mind if i do not get food or money to live by but if i am left in a world without even one word hmm. i would be the most miserable hmm. i need words because words bring people together they make us human uh they make story they allow us to create stories and that's that allows us to create the world so Well this so, is what you mean when you say that when you lose a language you lose a whole world that each of these words and ways of putting those words together and um telling stories as you say when if you peel it back it opens up a whole history and a whole culture and a whole universe um we're having this conversation in 2022 uh there is a effort by prime minister modi in india to put um an emphasis on hindi um is there an urgency in this current context um that more and more of these languages might be lost well uh, we we are having this conversation in 2022 the month is september and this very month heads of a few states got together in one part of the world and most of those heads are heading countries which are lost almost lost the habit of democracy and where word is a kind of a betrayal of the nation an offense where word is under punishment under surveillance now uh, declining democracies and artificial memory both have made existence of language extremely precarious in india 
the question of Hindi is, uh, has a historical background. That is, for our audience, I should say that there is an attempt to uh, force Hindi on the entire India, while India has several hundred languages, as I mentioned, and uh, many of them with print tradition, with rich literature. Still, Hindi is, uh, and I, I love the Hindi language. I love every language in the world. There's no, I can never hate a language. I just cannot. Uh, language is my first love. But imposition is something which is detested. Uh, in India, uh, Hindi is being uh, uh, imposed on people who do not like that imposition because Hindi is proposed as a language spoken by Hindus, which is a folly. It is not historically correct. It's not linguistically correct. Uh, yeah, when India and Pakistan became two nations, many people started wrongly saying that Urdu is the language of Pakistan, Hindi is the language, which is not the case. It is not so uh, in terms of actual data, actual historical facts. Uh, Urdu actually emerged in India. Uh, as, but uh, but uh, uh, when Hindi is uh, being promoted as the national language, it normally overlooks that imposition overlooks the fact that the constitution of India begins with the sentence, India, that is Bharat, which is the second name of India, is a union of states. And by union of states, I don't mean just territorial, geographical states. It's also union of mental states. Mm. It's in and of cultures. For the United States of America, I, it's my feeling. Uh, I, I was on the East Coast uh, for a while uh, writing some book. And then I went to California and I found that these are different mental states. <laughs> the smiles are different. The songs are different. The twinkle in the eyes is different. They are different in these. Uh, the, uh, so uh, it is as if the East Coast belongs to one age, uh, you know, the West Coast belongs to another age. And that is so in India also. Diversity uh, is a value I respect immensely. And uh, I do not think diversity of any kind ever becomes threat to unity. In fact, diversity fosters unity because that that allows people to respect each other. Now, I write, I, I write on these issues in various uh, journals, newspapers. I speak uh, as a public intellectual. And I do so when things happen outside India also. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a few years back, when uh, a black man uh, had to die because a, a cop had placed his uh, no, knee on his throat and he, he choked. And he said, I want to breathe, breathe, but how can I breathe? I write about that. I, what I'm saying is um, the government of India now, the present government, has been trying to iron out diversities and imposing an idea of unity. But that idea of unity can never sustain itself or last because India is a place which is which which has nurtured diversities all along for the last several thousand years. In, humans have been uh, inhabiting the uh, subcontinent, South Asia, for the last uh, forty-five thousand years, uh, when when the very first humans came and settled there, and at least for the last eight or ten nine thousand years, ever since agriculture touched India. Uh, humans have developed very complex languages there, and they, they've all been very diverse, very diverse. I love diversity. In fact, the best conversation in the world is when two or three persons who do not know each other's languages meet and try to communicate something. That's the most intimate conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, often what they use is sign language, right? Um, find some way to gesture. Um, in, in addition to, as you say, the sort of dubious association of the language Hindi with the religion Hindu, um, is some of this Hindi 
emphasis about de-emphasizing English? Well, the, uh, the English came to India about 400 years ago. 1600 is the year when the East India Company was set up and the British traveled to India. I must, uh, I, I must share this. Uh, the very first contact of the English merchant company with Indians uh, required many translators. English was translated uh, because the, the English merchants did not understand any of the Indian languages. And none of the Indians understood English. Uh, the Eng English was translated first into Portuguese. From Portuguese, it was translated into Armenian. From Armenian, it was translated into Persian. And from Persian, it was translated into whichever Indian language. As a result, the application for trading, permission to trade, which was submitted in the year 1600, 1602, 1602, got sanctioned in the year 1617. It took 15 years for the application to be translated, interpreted, retranslated. <laughs> the only situation, English came to India with such great difficulties. But in about 200 years, uh, the, the, the East India Company had got control of uh, most Indian states. And in, uh, towards the middle of the 19th century, English was made the language of higher learning in India. Uh, since then, English had its, its spread in the highest intellectual classes of India, but it did not percolate down to the masses. Uh, for instance, uh, while most people understand a few English words, most Indians do not understand English. Uh, the percentage of those Indians who understand English has still not crossed 15. 85% hmm. Indians do not understand very uh, the, even very simple, complicated English. I mean, they do understand that the train will depart at 8 a.m. that they understand. But uh, they will not understand that unlike yesterday, the train will not depart at 8 a.m., but the timing will be deferred. This is completely lost, completely lost. So, so English has a good spread in India as a language of knowledge, but English is rarely used in India as a language of prayer, as a language of intense emotional exchange, and as a language of intimate social occasions. For those occasions, Indian languages are used. Also in crowded markets, in, in malls, in 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 uh, uh, in uh, uh, brand selling uh, shops, English is used. But in crowded markets, where vegetables and fruit are, where fish and meat they are sold, where salt and chili are sold, where uh, uh, where uh, uh, spices are sold, uh, the Indian languages run the show, rule the show. Okay. So it is it is. Uh, uh, it, it is a very, very uh, uh, wonderful mix of language languages that Indians use. Uh, English is not made an official language in India. English is not included in the constitution as one of the official languages of India. But yet, English has its way of going around and occupying whatever space is available. So English continues. Uh, it's an uh, old colonial habit. Right. And every nook and cranny, every space that is available, English has occupied. So you'll see the road signs in English, names of buildings in English. Uh, uh, some of the most expensive, costly ads, advertisements in English. Uh, yet, uh, yet uh, its official status is a non-official language. Um, but I wanted to ask, so there was a, Pretty lengthy profile of you in the New York Times in June, but there was a quotation in that article that said, for all his social activism, meaning you, uh, his life's work remains 
India's languages and history. And it seems to me those are not two different things, your social activism and India's languages and history. Well, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I, uh, I have, uh, for the last few years, I have been trying to put together a group of uh, scholars in genetics, archaeology, history, linguistics, and social sciences to reconstruct the history of India over the last 12,000 years. 12,000 years. 12,000, <laughs> not much. <laughs> no, no, Rebecca, consider the fact that the Big Bang took place some 14 billion years ago. Okay, all right. Well, on that it's scale, difficult. it's not, it's recent. So yeah. Relatively, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is only human time. And uh, because the government of India decided to, it, it set up a committee to review the Indian past for the last 12,000 years. And I am worried, I'm concerned that such a committee might come up with a certain version of history, which might be, uh, uh, which may not be uh, very sympathetic to diversity, religious diversity, cultural diversity, and linguistic diversity, uh, which may not be uh, uh, ready to accept that Indians sometimes had triumphs and sometimes Indians had to face defeats such an official history showing only the great things about a place uh, might end up mixing truth with what uh, uh, your previous president said, post-truth. So, the, so uh, I, 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 I thought we must have a history which is science-based, rationality-based, evidence-based. And therefore, I brought uh, many scholars from all parts of the world together, specializing in different uh, segments of Indian past, and uh, put together a report. I'm going to release it on the 9th of October. Uh, okay. It's a doc yeah, document of about 600, 600 pages. So I'll first uh, publish it in English, and then I will have it translated in Tamil, Hindi, Kannada, Bengali, and uh, uh, and uh, Marathi, yes. So that people of India know what their history is. I think uh, uh, I think uh, if I did not do it, uh, I would I would uh, not be able to forgive myself. I think it's my responsibility to describe the, to describe the uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet had said, "Oh, time is out of joint, or oh, cursed spite. Time is out of joint, a cursed spite." that I was ever born to set it right. I want to stitch time and time together. I want to stitch syllable and syllable together so that the word and the world that it holds stay intact as human space, a space for love, for compassion, for relation, for, for solidarity, for harmony. I mean, my thoughts are out of place in this world, I know. But unless there are some mad people, how will the world go ahead? Right. Um, what language do you write in? Do you I write in Marathi. Yeah. I write in Marathi, which is a language with a history of about 1500 years. I write in Gujarati, which is a language with a history of about 1100 years. And I write in English, uh, which has a, which a language which has a history of about 1200 years. Uh, so I write in three ancient languages with a millennium of history. And I am perfectly uh, happy writing in any of these three. Uh, I do not think of X as my one as my mother tongue and the remaining two as my other tongues. Uh, when I when I write in a language or speak that language, however inadequately, howsoever inadequately, I I think it is my language. Every language in the world is my language. I wish <laughs> I could write in seven thousand languages. Why not? Why not? Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, someone asked: Siloti S I L O T I is considered a dialect. 
but it has its own script, Salati Nagri, N-A-G-R-I. Should it be considered a separate language or still a dialect? This is an interesting question of how do you define a language? Well, uh, I mean, I'm glad that a language has a script, but I would uh, argue that uh, it is not necessary for a language in order to be a language to have a script. I'll give an example. Uh, the king's version of the Bible was created in England by setting up a committee. The, the, the king invested money in having an English translation, authorized version was created. But they, they never set up any committee to create an English script. Roman script was used. So to that extent, I could say, one could say that the English language is a language without a script. It is still a language. I mean, any language almost can use any other, almost. The phonetically, some languages will prove. But for a language to be a language, there has to be a grammar, by which I do not mean a written grammar, but a language must have its own rules. I mean. Uh, if uh, there's a ground and somebody is playing hockey and somebody is playing football, the two games are distinct. Uh, so, uh, so the the language as a game becomes distinct when it has rules of the game for itself, a grammar, so whether a language is written or not written. Did Homer, the Greek poet, actually sit down and write anything? I mean, there are questions whether Homer was a person or a group, of, but setting that aside, uh, things came down orally for a long time. And then somebody wrote down those things. Writing came much later in human history. I mean, if humans have been speaking for 70,000 years, humans have been writing only for the last 7,000 years. Does it mean that language, that what they spoke before, prior to those 7,000 years were not languages. They were languages, of course. Uh, writing, perhaps, scripts, perhaps, have their origin in making marks for counting in sim simple arithmetic. And therefore, in many scripts, actually, uh, the vowel sounds approximate the uh, marks made for numbers as well. Mm -hmm. um, another guest asks, I've seen some perspective on language loss that takes the perspective that the sheer number of languages isn't sustainable in an ever connecting world and that some languages will have to be absorbed or neglected. Do you see language loss as an inevitable conclusion of industrialization and globalization? Or do you see a future where all languages can coexist without social or cultural loss? Okay, industrialization, globalization um, the, have been bad guys, uh, but they're not as bad as uh, one uh, no, in, in, for the uh, language question, but they're not the only culprits. There is something far different f f f f uh, happening than just the globalization and industrialization. And that is the emergence of memory. Hmm artificial memory, non-human intelligence, uh, uh, attempting transactions of the mind, which the brain used to do for humans naturally. Uh, there is, uh, uh, I think, uh, Marian Wolf, a professor of reading in UK, uh, published a lovely book called Proust, the French writer, and this, and this squid. And that book argues that uh, the broker's lobe, the, the part of the brain which analyzes uh, language transactions, uh, is showing fatigue, signs of fatigue in the process of human evolution. And humans are turning more to grasping the world through visual signs rather than oral signals. Uh, that is to say, sound is being displaced by graphic. And in a way, when humans turn to reading, 
or writing they were actually replacing sound with graphics we did not realize that we were moving away from language sound uh, language uh, in its essence is spoken and heard and not written and read but now we move to digital uh, digital signs uh, which are very fast traveling most of us travel in silence I, we most of us are enveloped in silence uh, because most of the time our linguistic transactions are through non speech either in whatsapp or emails therefore globalization and industrialization have been uh, heavy uh, uh, tolls for human languages but the change in the human brain is the refusal of the neurons to admit language as a means of understanding the world uh, is moving us towards a new existence which is enveloped in silence uh, it is an existence in the virtual world i mean even now uh, really uh, rebecca and ganesh are not speaking is is the image of ganesh speaking to the image of rebecca and it is it is uh, in this digital conversation we might create a space which is non physical entirely uh, in my country as in other countries is not enough to be just a citizen by being a body i mean you cannot be a citizen by just being a body you need a number social security number or whatever unless you have that number you are not a full person so the physical is being displaced by the the virtual and in that transition oral language auditory language is getting replaced by graphical digital uh, sound can travel only with so much of speed into so much of space but the digits can travel beyond this planet and into other planets electromagnetic uh, long distance travel very fast so humans are moving towards that kind of communication that said let me add humans will not forsake language the question is whether they will use sound based language or or use some other basis for their communication but humans just cannot be humans unless they communicate express i will not say talk i will not say unless they talk uh, because speech is under uh, stress at the moment but communication expression is peculiarly human other animals express they do but humans uh, humans express far too much uh, and uh, far too um, uh, intriguingly in a complicated way and that's what makes us very a different animal species and i just love humans because they express and that expression is language well even if it's my image talking to your image i am delighted that we have the technology that allows me in the us and you in india to have this conversation and people all over to join us so thank you so so much for being with us for the past hour it has been an honor for me a great privilege and i just admire your institution uh, because i i try to look at other institutions uh, that try to uh, you know do something with languages but what the planet word has done is unique and uh, more over it, it has been a great success uh, i wish uh, planet word a very long life at least a few billion years <laughs> thank you we'll take it and thank you so much for joining us and thank you to the audience we look forward to thank seeing you, you have a great day okay thank you good night bye bye